I want to begin this morning before we even turn to our text. Let me ask you a question. If everyone in this church were as thankful as you, how thankful would we be? How thankful would we be? Stop and think about that. You know, as Americans, we set aside one day a year that we call Thanksgiving Day. But isn't it true that as a child of God, as we just got done singing, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, isn't that in and of itself enough of a reason to thank God every single day and not just on Thanksgiving Day? There is much to be thankful for. And oh, I am so guilty, and you speak for yourself. I won't stand here as your judge and jury, but I wonder, how thankful are we as the people of God? In Psalm 103, if you would care to turn there with me, and I want to read together the first 13 verses there. The psalmist David has a wellspring of gratefulness, of thanksgiving, of praise that he's offering to the Lord here in Psalm 103. Notice the psalmist begins, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. May the Lord add his blessing today to the teaching of his word. In just a few short days, we will celebrate Thanksgiving Day once again. For scores of years, our nation has observed this festive day by presidential degree. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln set aside the last Thursday in November as a day of prayer and of praise. And it's a shame that we have only one day set aside each year to give thanks to God as a nation. Because my friend, I'm sure you'll be quick to agree with me today, No nation has been blessed like the United States of America other than Israel. Amen? We are privileged to live in such a great land. And we are a great country because of God's blessing upon us. If God ever withdraws his hands off of this nation, we are in serious trouble. You know, we should have some time set aside each and every day to give our praise to him who has blessed us so richly. I believe, quite honestly, that if we would praise God more, the world would doubt him less. Amen? Amen. If you and I would praise God more, I believe the world would doubt him less. We have many reasons to be thankful. Here in Psalm 103, David offers a symphony of praise for the blessings that God has so graciously bestowed upon him. So as we look at this psalm together this morning, what was it that made David so joyful? Well, first of all, he is thankful because God forgives all of our sins. God offers us forgiveness for all of our sins, not just some, but all. Amen. Not just some, but all. And not just for a select group of individuals, but for everyone, all mankind. Hallelujah. You see, my friend, the gospel is not only a message of love and forgiveness, but it is also a message of hope. The rut you find yourself in doesn't need to remain the same. True change is just a prayer away. I challenge you today, rather than looking at all the things that are wrong in your life, start counting your blessings and you'll find out that the things that are wrong are minuscule compared to the things that are right. 
Amen? I mean, it's a matter of attitude. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of how we look at these things and recognizing there is indeed much to be thankful for. All we have to do is repent, forsake our sin, invite Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, and God will remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west, is what the psalmist tells us here in verse 12. You know, when you look at it from God's perspective and from man's perspective, salvation is an amazing gift that is offered by God that takes an eternity to fully appreciate. I'm going to let that sink in. Salvation is an amazing gift offered by God that takes an eternity to appreciate. Years ago, Andre Crouch wrote a song How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. And it goes on. To God be the glory. You know the song. But it is so true. How can I? How can you truly express our thanksgiving to such a great and benevolent God? One day, an individual was visiting with his pastor in the pastor's office. And as he was waiting to get the uh, pastor's attention because he was on the phone, he picked up a book that was on the table and began to read. Suddenly, he shouted, glory, thank you, Lord. The pastor asked, what are you so excited about? The man replied, this book says that in certain places, the ocean is five miles deep. Yes, that's right, said the pastor. What of it? The man replied, the Bible says that my sins have been cast into the depth of the sea. And if it's that deep, I'm not afraid of them coming up again. Because you see, the pressure of the water is so great there that even if the largest battleship should be sunk to that depth, it would be crushed like an eggshell. This forgiveness is a promise of the Father provided by the Son and available to all. Aren't you glad that when God forgives you of your sins, he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness and puts up a sign that says no fishing. Glory. Glory. That's the kind of a God that we serve. You see, from the depths of our heart, a sense of gratitude should well up and ascend like incense to the throne of God because enduring gratitude is born in a transformed heart. Gratitude that wells up not just from momentary blessings, but from lifelong blessings. Friend, I want to submit to you today, it's time that you and I quit walking around and saying, God, what have you done for me in the last five minutes? I believe that it's time that we open up our memory banks and start remembering where God has brought us from. But even more exciting is where God is leading us to. Amen? Amen? Don't get caught up in the quagmire of present circumstances, of present situations. Stop complaining and start praising, and you'll be amazed what God can and will do in your life. I believe it's time for us to quit being whiners and start being praisers. I don't know how to put it any more blunt than that. Quit whining. Quit complaining. Quit telling God about how hard you have it. We don't have it that bad. We really don't compared to a lot of other people around the world. This past week, I did some visiting in several nursing homes. Boy, you want to find a reason to be thankful. I challenge you, go over to Harrisonburg Rehab, go to Avante, go to Oakley, go to Bridgewater, and just walk down the halls. I saw a man there that didn't have any legs. I saw a woman there that was blind and missing an arm. I saw another lady there that was just staring vacantly off into space. And even when I stopped and said hello to her, she just continued to stare vacantly off into space. A lot of them are younger than me. They're not all old. You know, we have this misnomer of thinking that people in nursing homes and assisted living homes are up in years and that they've lived their life. That's not always the case. There is much to be thankful for. There is much to be thankful for. And it's time that you and I start praising God. Why do I encourage you to praise God? Because the Bible tells me that God inhabits the praises of his people. And how many of you know that when God is among his people, wonderful things begin to transpire? 
Not only can we thank God for his forgiveness, but David continues here in verse 3. He tells us that we are to thank God for his healing, who heals all your diseases. They're in the latter part of verse 3. You know, and I confess, when I first considered this passage of Scripture, I was reluctant to refer to it because I couldn't reconcile it with the fact that God does not always heal everyone with an incurable disease. But I believe the Holy Spirit can help us to see three important truths that are contained in this verse. First of all, all divine healing and recovery from sickness, from injury, from surgery is the result of the healing properties that God has built into our bodies. Medicine, surgery, and therapy are merely tools of God's healing ministry. Second, and listen carefully now, this verse doesn't say that God heals everyone's diseases, but rather that he heals all diseases. Catch that? He doesn't say that God heals everyone's diseases, but rather that he heals all diseases. There is no disease or sickness that falls beyond God's healing power, not even what you and I would call incurable. He is the great physician, but for whatever reason known only to God, sometimes God doesn't choose to heal in the natural realm someone that we are praying for. That doesn't mean that he can't. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have all authority and all over power over it, but God is omniscient and he sees into the future and he knows all things. And sometimes, you know, we don't always understand the way that God's work, but it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. My job is to pray for the healing. And if God chooses to heal in another way by taking them home, is that not the ultimate healing? And I'm not using that as a cop-out. I'm not using that, you know, as, as something, you know, that, that's trying to make an excuse for God not doing what he's doing. But listen, even when Jesus was here on earth, he did not heal everybody that was sick. There are occasions in the Gospels, I will be the first to admit it, where it talks about they brought to the sick to them, to Jesus, and he healed all of them. It does refer to that on occasion. But there are other occasions where there were other sick people there. But Jesus, for example, the Pool of Shalom, where the man who had the uh, illness for 38 years and was lying there waiting for an angel to come down. Why was it that Jesus only healed them? I'm sure that there were others lying around there as well. I mean, that's just one of many examples that I could give you. But he's God and I'm not. And we need to accept that. It's not a lack of faith on the person's part. I mean, I get so upset when I hear someone, well, we prayed for brother so-and-so or we prayed for sister so-and-so and they didn't get healed, but if they'd only had enough faith, what about you? Maybe you didn't have enough faith. Ah, Come on, let's quit pointing fingers. Let's quit accusing each other and leave it up to God. Our job is to pray. It is his job to heal and he will heal those that he sees fit to heal. And if he doesn't choose to heal them in a physical way, there's a reason for it that one day we'll understand. Amen. Yes. Thank you. See what this verse is saying. God heals all diseases, but not everyone who has one. He is the great physician. And I will still pray the prayer of faith. I will still lay my hands on them. I will still anoint them with oil. And I will exercise the measure of faith that God has given me. But then ultimately, I release it over to the Lord for his will to be done. Last, the psalmist is speaking to his soul. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, who heals all your diseases. And listen, friend, I believe that he's talking about the disease of the soul. The diseases of the soul emanate from the virus of sin. Jesus identified this virus and its symptoms in Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20, where he says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. These are the things which make a man unclean. You see, these souls' diseases can be traced back to our fallen nature and the effects of sin. But God can give permanent healing to the soul. Can you say amen? God gives permanent healing to the soul. Just as some illnesses of the body can be cured by medicines and surgery, so the soul of man can be cleansed and made whole when the Holy Spirit is allowed to process us completely. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 147, verse 3, tells us this. He, that is God, heals the brokenhearted, and binds up their wounds. Yes, thank you, Lord. Aren't you thankful yes. that Jesus Christ is the wound healer? Amen. 
Aren't you glad that he's the mender of broken hearts? And aren't you glad when you've lost hope, when you've lost focus, when you've lost purpose, when you've lost direction, hallelujah, God is in control. And God has the ability of stepping into that situation and restoring a joy, restoring a hope, and restoring a confidence of knowing that if God is for me, what can stand against me? David continues in verse 4. He tells us that not only are we to be thankful for the fact that God has forgiven us, and not only for the fact that God heals us, but that also he redeems us. Notice in verse 4, who redeems your life from destruction. And another way to render this verse is this. He keeps your life from going to waste. God keeps your life from going to waste. The Lord not only saves our souls from hell, but he also redeems our lives from the clutches of the devil. Listen, friend, if you're not aware of it, Satan is on a mission to destroy your life and damn your soul for all eternity. All you have to do is look at our prisons, our hospitals, and our halfway houses. They are filled to overflowing with people whose lives are being destroyed by the enemy. But thanks be to God who redeems our lives from his power. David tells us in Psalm 42, verses 2 and 3, He also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet up on a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Glory. Glory. He has set my feet upon a rock. He brought me up out of the horrible pit. He established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You see, friends, God gives his people a purpose to live. He gives us meaning Our lives really do count. They are not one that is lived in vain. He keeps our lives from going to waste. And our lives are filled with eternal purpose. This is one of the benefits that we receive as a result of knowing God. The London Times publishes all the prices paid for art objects and all the art galleries around the world. If a painting is sold in New York or Paris or Rome or London, the Times give the full details of the sale. You can judge the value of the painting by the price that was paid for it. Well, friend, I submit to you today, we can judge our value to God by the price that Jesus paid for us, the depths into which he had to reach in order to redeem us. We can't say that we've paid for any of it because as the old hymn of the church says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Boy, if you don't start praising the Lord, your pastor is going to go crazy up here. I'm going to tell you what. There is much to be thankful for. There is much to be thankful for. Come on, folks. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. He not only forgives us of our sins. He not only heals us, but he redeems us. Praise his holy name. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Doesn't stop there. Pardon my English, but it keeps getting gooder and gooder. It gets better. It gets better. David continues here in verse 4. He says, for his loving kindness and tender mercies, he crowns you. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. In one of Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman's meetings, a man rose to give the following remarkable testimony. He started off by saying, I got off at Philadelphia Depot one day as a tramp. For the past year, I had begged on the streets for a living. One day, I touched a man on the shoulder and said, Mr., please give me some money so I can have something to eat. As soon as I saw his face, I recognized him. It was my father. I said, Dad, don't you recognize me? Throwing his arms around me, he cried, I found you. Oh, thank God, I found you. All I have is yours. Think of it. I, a tramp, 
stood begging my father for a few dollars when for 18 years he had been searching for me to give me all that he had. How similar this is to the loving kindness and the tender mercies of the Lord that he desires to share with us each and every day. Friend, you may be here this morning and you may not realize it. Maybe you've been running from God and maybe you don't even realize that you need God in your life. But I want to challenge you this morning in understanding that God's been looking for you ever since the moment you drew your first breath. And although you may have gone your prodigal way, and even though you may have tried things your way and have tried and dabbled in the things of the world only to find that they turned to dust in your hand and, oh you know, yes, there is a temporary satisfaction. I would never deny that. It's temporary though. And there are consequences. There's only one true source of joy. There's only one true source of peace. There's only one true source of contentment. There's only one true source of satisfaction. And that is when you come to the Father and ask him for forgiveness of your sins. And he truly does indeed become your father in the truest sense of the word. And you become his child. Child, where you been? I've been looking for you all your life. Yes, thank you, Lord. Come home. Because all that I have thank is yours. Oh, thank you. What a mighty God. What a loving father, full of loving kindness, full of tender mercies. His mercies are new every morning. Praise the Lord. David continues and tells us that we are to bless the Lord for his satisfaction and renewal. Here in verse five, he says, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This reminds me of the words of Jesus given in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells us in Matthew 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, or whatever translation, for they shall be filled. You see, my friend, there is a great paradox here. We're satisfied, but we're never satisfied. You know, I'm very fortunate. My family on both sides are blessed with great cooks, I don't know about you, but I always look forward to holiday dinners because regardless of who is hosting it, whether we are or my sisters or Bonnie's mom or, or, uh, you know, whoever it might prove to be, regardless of who's hosting it, because of all the different entrees and desserts and whatever, trust me, you are full and well satisfied. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. All right. I'm always satisfied when I eat some, but much against my better judgment. I always want more because of what I've experienced it. It makes me want to taste it again and again and again and again. Even the leftovers are good for the next day. Now listen, we're filled And the filling is so wonderful that we want more when it comes to the righteousness of God. When we seek God's righteousness, he grants it. But I'm going to nitpick a little bit this morning, and I may get some people mad, but I I really feel like God's telling me to say this. Why is it that we get satisfied so quickly with so little when it comes to spiritual things. Why is it that it only takes 90 minutes on Sunday morning to feed me spiritually? If others were as faithful to God's house on Sunday night, if others were as faithful to coming to the Bible studies on Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. How often would the doors of this church stay open if they were as faithful as you? Now you may say, Pastor, you're nitpicking. Pastor, you know, you were doing great until you got to here. But listen to me, my friend. We are a blessed people in having the privilege of having this church where the doors are open more than once a week. If you haven't said amen, that's a good time to say amen. Amen. We are blessed. 
Not because I think I'm the world's greatest preacher. Not because I think you need to hear me preach three times a week. No. But you need to be fed from God's word more than once a week. Yes, we do. Yes. Come on, church. Yes. Yes. Do you know how many people around this world would love to have a church to come to three or four times a week for a service? I challenge you to pick up the magazine that's out there on the table that has the TV and read it, Vision, and read about some of the countries in this world where they have to meet behind closed doors or underground in, 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 in fear that they're going to be discovered. But we are so blessed living in America where we have the privilege of coming out and worshiping God. Look, I know there's times you can't be here and whatever, but I also am smart enough to know there are times that you could be. And I'm just going to say it. Might as well get you really mad at me. You don't choose to be. Amen. Where are my priorities? Oh, I can sing. I can raise my hands. I can praise the Lord. And I know there are some of you that come from backgrounds where, you know, you attended churches where they only had church once a week, but you know what? You're not in that church anymore. And do I love God? Yes. Do I want more of him? Yes. Do I really appreciate his righteousness, his goodness, his many blessings, his wonderful gift of forgiveness, his wonderful gift of healing, his wonderful gift of redemption, his wonderful gift of tender mercies and loving kindness? That he satisfies my mouth with good things. How many of you know that even the leftovers from God's table are good? I don't always hit a home run when I preach. I'll be the first to admit it. There's a lot of times I feel like I've struck out. But God never fails, and he's promised that his word will never return into him void, and that's what I rest in. That's where I find confidence. Thank God it's not depending on me, because if it was, we'd be in trouble. Psalm 107 verse 9 says, He has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. But that's not the end. Verse 5 tells us that God will renew my youth like the eagles. Now, if you've known me for very long, you know that I'm a big fan of eagles. I have pictures of eagles. I have statues of eagles, anything with an eagle on it, I like. Because I love what an eagle stands for. It's known for three things. It's eyesight, it's strength, and it's longevity. But it's also known for its annual molting. And a life in pursuit of God's righteousness constantly renews. That's what molting means. It's the, the eagle gets rid of the old feathers. It gets rid of the, even at some point in time, it, it re, uh, renews its beak. It breaks its beak off and then grows a new one. It's very vulnerable during that time. But it also refreshes and revives us. A life in pursuit of God's righteousness constantly renews, constantly refreshes, constantly revives us. And the wonderful thing about it is God is the one who's doing it all. Amen. Thank you, Lord. No wonder the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Yes. You know, almost every day, we hear of terrorists taking the life of innocent victims all over the world. And as a result, many are living in a spirit of fear. But all I remind you this morning, my friend, what the apostle Paul wrote to his understudy Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 God has not given us the spirit of fear, say it with me, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God gives. The devil gives you the spirit of fear. God gives you a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And it's time that we start putting that into practice and overcoming and culturing these fears and recognize I don't need to be afraid of anything because I have God. Now, I'm not talking about going out here and being reckless and whatever, and you know how we were when we were young, we were invincible, we thought we were Superman. I'm not talking about that. Use good common sense. But I don't need to be afraid. As Christians, we should not be a stranger to persecution. It's part of our history. 
We're seeing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy predicting the days preceding the rapture of the church. And it serves as a reminder to us of the importance of remaining still thankful, still thankful, even in the face of evil. Why? Because, my friend, we have a hope that is grounded on a rock. And not just any rock, but the rock. The rock. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What was that rock? Friend, it wasn't Peter, as the Catholic Church would have you to believe. It was Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone, as we sang earlier. He is the rock of my salvation. He's the rock that I run to. He is my shelter in the time of storm. David said in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and deliverer, the God of my strength, in whom I will trust. So I ask you this morning, as we wind this down, how about you? Are you living a life in a relationship with God? Is it something more than you just do on Sunday morning to fulfill your religious obligation and you can put a check mark, went to church Sunday? Or do you really desire a deeper walk with God? That's the question I have. How grateful are you for God's blessings? Do you recognize the importance of being in God's house to meet together with God's precious people every time you have an opportunity to do so? Where are my priorities? I can only answer that for me. You might be sitting there saying, well, you're the preacher. You have to come. No, I don't have to. I want to. I want to. Because you see, there are other places I could go. And I don't say that to brag, but really I could. There are places that are hungry for God's word. And sometimes I ask myself, Lord, Why is it that the majority of American churches don't even have church on Sunday night anymore? You know what the answer is? You talk to the pastors because people didn't come. We've allowed other things to take God's place. Come on now. I can tell I'm getting all kinds of brownie points, but really, we have. We, we have allowed other things to take God's place place in our life. If I'm honest with you and you're honest with me. If you're living a life in relationship with God, you cannot help but praise him. But we have to be careful not to fall into the rut of saying one thing and doing another. David said, I will praise him with all that is within me. This means praise him with my attitude Praise him with my actions. Praise him with my family, my finances. You fill in the blank. What he's basically saying, I will not only praise him in word, but I will also praise him in deed. I will praise him with everything. With everything that is within me. Remember to always be grateful to the Lord, even in the face of evil. Because, friends, the bottom line is we are blessed. We are blessed. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Lord, we have much to be thankful and grateful for. We are so blessed so blessed and so spoiled.
God, I, I pray this prayer for myself. I am, I'm, not, I'm not throwing stones at anybody here today. Forgive me of the times that I have not thanked you. Your mercies are new every morning. Your blessings are numerous. They're innumerable. When I begin to count my blessings, God, I quickly run out of paper. You have been so, so good. I've not deserved one, but yet, because you're a heavenly father who loves his children, you continue to bless. And I no sooner receive one blessing and then there's another, and then there's another, and then there's another. Forgive me, Lord, of the times that I have not loved you the way that I should. And I've allowed other things to crowd you out of my life. And I've allowed them to become my God, if the truth of the matter were known. Because anything I put ahead of you becomes my God, is what your word tells me. So search us today, Lord. And I pray that if there needs to be a change in any of our lives, change of our priorities, change of our desires, just as when we sit down to a physical meal and partake of something good and we want to go back for seconds and in some instances thirds, help us, Lord, to desire spiritual food with that same intensity, that same desire, that same delight of wanting more of you. Lord, I pray that we'll take this message to heart today. Thank you for your forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, for your redemption. Thank you, Lord, for your tender mercy and for your tender grace. And oh, Jesus, for knowing today that you indeed are a God that provides for our healing that you renew our strength. Help us to be a people, Lord, not just in church on Sunday, but every day of the week. And that we begin our day thanking you for another day of life. And at the end of the day, thanking you for the way that you walk by our side through the day's journey. With heads bowed and eyes closed, in the closing moments of the service this morning, friend, if by chance you're here and you have yet to experience the Father's love firsthand, to really know what it means to have your sins removed as far as the East is from the West. If that's you here this morning, I'm simply just going to ask you right where you are, raise your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. We simply want to pray together with you. Asking Christ into your life. Yes, I see that hand. You may put it down. Is there another? Yes. Yes. You want to invite Jesus into your life today, knowing that before you walk out of here, your sins have been forgiven, your name has been written into the Lamb's Book of Life, and that you're a child of God. Three hands have already gone up. Is there yet another? You want to invite Jesus into your life today. Yes. Yes. I see those hands. You may put them down. Others? Yes, see those hands. Anyone else? I want you to pray together with me the following prayer. And those of you who raised your hands today, let me just encourage you as you pray this prayer, pray it with a heart of sincerity. Maybe you didn't raise your hand and you should have. Know today that God hears the cries of his children. And as you pray this prayer with sincerity, know that God is going to forgive you and give you a brand new start. And as you continue to put your trust and your confidence in him, know that God is not just going to begin the journey with you, but he'll walk with you the entire way. It may be difficult, but he's your rock. He's your strength. He's your fortress. Rely on him and not yourself. He's the one that will get you through. 
I'm going to ask you collectively as a congregation in just a moment to pray your prayer with me, but I want to put a second part to this prayer, and that is this. If you need a closer walk with God today, if you've allowed other things to crowd God out of your life and God has not been the priority in your life that he needs to be, that's between you and the Lord. I don't judge anybody. I got enough to worry about right here with this guy. But if that's you and you want prayer, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just slip it up quickly and put it back down. You need a closer walk with God. Yes, hands are going up all over. Yes, yes. Thank you for your honesty. Yes, yes. Would you pray with me today? Repeat after me, please. Dear Lord, I ask today for you to come into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. I need your forgiveness. So I ask you to wash away my every sin with your precious blood. I confess and I believe that you are the only begotten Son of God that takes away the sins of the world. So remove my sins. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life that I may receive this precious gift of salvation and eternal life. Thank you for hearing my prayer, for saving my soul. And with your help, I believe you'll give me the ability to walk in righteousness with you. Thank you for saving my soul. And Jesus, help me to love you, to serve you the way that you love me. Help me, Lord, be found faithful in my Christian walk and not allow other things to crowd you out. May you be the number one priority in every area of my life. And give me the love and the determination to be found faithful in service to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I want to close the service out a little bit differently, and that's no reflection upon any of you. But that song has just been going over and over and over and over in my mind. Maybe you don't know it, but by now, hopefully you have. It's very simple. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Whole. W-H-O-L-E. Whole. You have made me a whole person. Because I not only know you as my Savior and as my Lord, but I also know you as my Father and as my soon returning King. Thank you, Lord for giving to me thy great salvation. Salvation from what? Not only salvation from my sins, but salvation from the deceitfulness of this world. Salvation from the clutch of Satan and the tyranny of sin. Salvation in the fact that he's given me a blessed hope where there was once fear, there is now hope and assurance of knowing the goodness of my God. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And would you just join with me in singing that one more time by way of benediction? Following that, you may consider yourself to be dismissed. Remember, folks, the service tonight at 6. I, I hope that many of you will come out. I hope that many of you will come out. Come expecting and believing God for great things. I really believe that God's wanting to do some wonderful things. I really do. But how much do I want Him to? How much do I want Him to? We vote with our feet, don't we? We vote with our feet. So join with me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. God bless you. You are dismissed.